Whether it was Patrick Stewart's Journey to Gurney or Tom Selleck trading an indie for Magna, here are a few sci-fi roles that could have gone to the wrong person. Sylvester Stallone is a hands-on kind of boss. That trait turned multiple franchises into box office winners, but also resulted in some staggeringly stupid sequels. While Demolition Man wasn't his gig to control, his behavior would be no different. Lori Petty, then a fresh face, showed off her dramatic chops in a league of their own and her action capabilities in Point Break. She won the co-starring role of Lenina Huxley in Demolition Man, but she got the axe after two days on set. The reason? She and Stallone didn't mix. In 1993, Petty was quoted by Entertainment Weekly as saying, Sly and I were like oil and water. Producer Joel Silver needed a replacement, fast, and Sandra Bullock fit the bill. Petty eventually found her own groove. It's easy to see how she would have become a bigger part of Demolition Man, and Bullock's lighter, softer tone makes her a foil that amps the uber-masculine strength of Stallone vs. Wesley Snipes. Ultimately, Demolition Man is a fun, ridiculous movie that works because of its mix of explosions and familiar tropes. Bullock is definitely an upgrade in the film we got. I don't know. Thanks. The actors playing the Marines and James Cameron's aliens spent several weeks together in rehearsal, customizing their character's armor and building a natural camaraderie that comes through on screen. Then, Michael Bean came in late, and he even inherited some other guy's armor instead of putting together his own. That other guy was the warrior star James Remar, who needed to be replaced several weeks into filming. Facing a drug charge, he was removed from the production, and Bean spent a fast weekend flying to England to pick up the slack after producer Gail Ann Hurd personally called him. A Cameron veteran, Bean's unflappable Corporal Hicks becomes Ripley's bedrock for the movie's back half. He matches up to Sigourney Weaver's charisma so well that we never notice he feels a little more quiet with his fellow Marines. And yes, we're still mad that he's not getting the redemption he deserves in the still-canceled Neil Blomkamp alien film. It boggles the mind to think of a time when Sir Patrick Stewart would have turned up on a set and gotten a… whatever, let's go with it. Today, he ranks as a genre icon thanks to his portrayals of Professor Charles Xavier and Captain Jean-Luc Picard and as one of the best theatrical performers of his generation. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate." So it's never not a surprise to look back at David Lynch's Dune and see him as Gurney Halleck. It wasn't supposed to be, but the facts remain vague. During an Emerald City Comic Con panel in 2013, Patrick Stewart himself revealed that casting was meant for someone else, but he showed up and Lynch just rolled with it. For today's sci-fi fans, it's an interesting look back at the early days of Stewart's career. Lynch's Dune featured a top-notch cast of talented professionals, and though his role was a small one, Stewart's heartfelt reunion with Paul late in the film delivers a moment of real movie magic. Martial arts star Jean-Claude Van Damme was still building his film career when the classic sci-fi action movie Predator started filming. That's when director John McTiernan recruited Van Damme to add his athletics to the film's Alien Hunter. That's also when the trouble started. Stacked up next to the hulking cast, which included Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jesse Ventura, the 5-foot, 10-inch Van Damme loses a lot of menace. Reportedly, his version of the alien suit wasn't much fun either. Enter Kevin Peter Hall, who previously filled a Bigfoot suit for the far lighter Harry and the Hendersons. At 7-foot plus, the new hunter towered over these comparatively puny Earthlings. It wasn't hard to tell that this yacha provided the apex predator the film needed to be awesome. Not only does Hall get to cameo with his own face during the helicopter rescue at the end, but he returned as another Yacha and their elder for Predator 2. Hall died in 1991, but what he did for this sci-fi icon will remain immortal. Veteran actor Lance Henriksen is a familiar face to James Cameron fans, and it should be no surprise to find out that they're longtime friends. Henriksen even helped Cameron land his first major movie with The Terminator. The Futurist, a biography of James Cameron by Rebecca Keegan, recounts the tale of Henriksen showing up in full Terminator regalia in order to impress the film's financiers. Until the studio sent Arnold Schwarzenegger over to discuss the role of Kyle Reese, Cameron expressed no interest. Meeting face-to-face -face changed everything, with Cameron realizing the tall, muscular, and career-savvy Austrian would make one hell of a killer robot. Cameron kept Henriksen for a smaller but important role as a cop, and the pair remained good friends. It was a last-minute shakeup that turned out well for everyone. The Terminator launched the careers of both Schwarzenegger and Cameron into orbit, and Henriksen would go on to be the unlikely heart of Aliens and to play dozens of great, often criminally underrated roles. Go binge Henriksen in the X-Files adjacent series Millennium and thank us later. The Matrix Resurrections is a funny, ultra-meta sequel, but it is fair to say that there's some understandable dissent over the lack of the original Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne, being replaced by a younger, even more aware version of himself. Fishburn appears in flashback footage, but the entire point of the new Morpheus is that this soul-centric finale centers on finding and being true to yourself. 
He's colorful, groovy, and upbeat about Thomas's chances to regain his power when his predecessor needed to experience some dark times to keep that faith. Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, who brings his stellar energy to even the most lacking roles, makes for the perfect spiritual leader for a story about securing the happy ending you deserve. The old Morpheus is the past, and he deserves his happy ending in Revolutions, standing at the edge of a free Zion. Terrence Howard gave us a pretty good James Rhodes in Iron Man as a stoic foil to Tony Stark's antics and the only sane man in town. Howard didn't return for Iron Man 2, with the stated real reason being a dispute over his paycheck, which is an honest possibility. His departure came late in pre-production, however, and Don Cheadle had to sign on fast with little idea of what would come next. With no disrespect to Terrence Howard's solid film chops, the results were great. Cheadle takes Howard's stoic nature towards Stark and turns it into a lively unflappability that's sometimes the only thing that can deflate the billionaire playboy when he's running full steam. Colonel Rhodes is now Cheadle's signature role, not to overshadow his Academy Award-nominated work in Hotel Rwanda. For Star Wars legend Harrison Ford to get the chance to wear Han Solo's vest, he had to be the last-minute phone call after multiple A-listers, including Al Pacino, Christopher Walken, and Burt Reynolds all passed on the opportunity. Just two years before he died, Reynolds vocally regretted turning down the gig. It was a decision that would also later help make Ford the final choice for Indiana Jones. That was a touchy situation, as George Lucas, who wrote the script for Raiders of the Lost Ark, voiced doubts to director Steven Spielberg about turning Ford into their go-to guy after Han's popularity took off. The original choice, Tom Selleck, couldn't get out of his contract for Magnum P.I. It's not hard to picture the Hawaiian shirt-wearing TV heartthrob searching for the Ark and fighting Nazis, but this twist of history ensured Ford's blockbuster future. Ford's competition turned out fine, of course. Reynolds left behind a legacy of classic movies and surprise TV appearances, and Selleck is still trucking with a thriving TV career while also explaining how our aging grandparents can make money off their house without losing it. If Star Wars taught us anything, it's that taking a percentage of a guaranteed moneymaker will feed your family for decades to come. Matt Damon knew that when James Cameron talked to him about his Avatar project, offering a 10% cut of the box office profits. But Damon was in the middle of a Bourne film with more on the way and had to decline. Sam Worthington, meanwhile, was a fresher Aussie face with nowhere to go but up. In between his CGI-heavy shoots for the sprawling Avatar franchise, Worthington left his mark on acclaimed miniseries like Manhunt Unabomber and Under the Banner of Heaven. It's also true that he lends a steady new guy humility that proves he was the right choice for Avatar. Dennis Hopper always gave everything to every performance. He was the sort of livewire talent that made the infamous 1993 Super Mario Bros. movie even more watchable today, and that's saying a lot. It's a terrific attribute, but not always the right thing for a story. The Truman Show originally landed Hopper to play the god archetype director Kristoff, but he made a quick departure early in filming over creative differences with director Peter Weir, as reported by Variety in 1997. Ed Harris was brought in fast, and his version adds the quiet menace and absolute pressure on Truman Burbank's life that makes the movie unforgettable. Kristoff is, in the end, unable to descend from his directorial throne. All he can do is appeal, in Harris's perfectly stony voice, to Truman's fears. Excellent stuff. Spike Jonze's Her sees the reclusive Theodore, played by Joaquin Phoenix, help his voice-only AI assistant become her own person, as she melds with others of her kind to achieve a technological singularity. It's heady stuff about the way our relationships enable us to grow as people. In any case, Her rides or dies on your feelings about Samantha's voice. She's Scarlett Johansson, in full gentle purr mode, and that's pretty hard to resist. Hello, I'm here. Oh. Hi. But Samantha was originally voiced by Samantha Morton, an English actor with a sweet, earthy voice that comes through the best in her role as a troubled precog in Minority Report. It created a dynamic with Phoenix that didn't work for Jones, and Johansson redubbed the role in post-production. It's an upgrade that suits the intimate tone Ted is emboldened by to become a little more extroverted. In the end, the film rates as fascinating stuff that digs into the best of science fiction's potential.